Dear God, even though the events of 9-11 took place long ago, most of us can still recall them like it was yesterday. Some, more than others, are still feeling the effects and the pain. On this day, we remember all those who lost their lives and their loved ones to this terrible tragedy. We lift up their families and their friends and ask for strength, peace, and comfort. We also remember and honor those heroes who stepped in to help, to save, to serve. And we will never forget those who gave their lives for the noble cause of rescuing others. We are forever grateful and pray blessing and comfort over their families. We pray for the spirit of unity to revisit our nation, the unity we felt in the midst of our struggles and our confusion. We pray that our citizens would look to God for wisdom and guidance, just as many did during that time of uncertainty. But most of all, we pray for the swift return of our Savior, who will one day put an end to all tragedies and to all tears. We love you, and we pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we pray for his return because we have the promise that when he returns, he will right all wrongs. We read about that in Revelation 21. Last book of the Bible it says this in verse 4, He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone, listen, forever. Amen. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. Man, when Jesus returns, He comes as King to establish His kingdom. In Revelation 19, we, we get this prophetic picture of his return. Verse 16, it says, On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of, of all kings and Lord of all lords. So in light of, of the chaos and the terror that we see in this world, we, we pray for this utopic kingdom where he reigns as monarch supreme and there's, there's peace and safety and righteousness we pray for the kingdom but do you realize that those guys on 9-11 that hijacked those planes and used them as weapons of terror they were also looking for a kingdom do you realize that's what motivated them do you understand, and, and many don't, that, that Islam, the religion of Islam, teaches that there is a coming one who they call Al-Mahdi, the guided one. And, and the, the Mahdi will bring in, usher in this caliphate, this worldwide Islamic kingdom. And they believe that, that the events leading up to that will be that the world will, will be in this chaotic mess and that there'll be this great war, get this, in the area of Syria and Iraq. And many Muslims believe that they can hasten the coming of the Mahdi by creating this chaos and this war. That's what ISIS is all about. You say, why did they go after Syria? And what's going on in Iraq? Because that's in their prophecies. They're trying to make this happen. Why did they fly those planes into the building? Do they not like us? They not only don't like us, they're trying to hasten this pro prophecy of their kingdom, their Islamic kingdom. See, folks, a desire for a kingdom is nothing new. That's the history of the world. I mean, 
the, the history of the world could be summarized by the, 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 the rise and the fall of kingdoms. Sometimes they're called dynasties, sometimes they're called empires, but that's our, our world. In more recent history, the 17 and 1800s, we, we saw the, that many countries in, in Europe, like Spain and France and Great Britain, they literally were colonizing, trying to colonize the world in an attempt to build their empires, their kingdoms. In fact, Great Britain called their collection, what? The United Kingdom. And we still refer to Britain many times as the United Kingdom. I, I mean, certainly here in Hawaii, we understand probably better than many the, the loss and the desire for a kingdom. Since 1893, when the U.S. overthrew the Kingdom of Hawaii, there have been dozens of organizations that have sprung up here in the islands to call for Hawaiian sovereignty. And what do they really, what is their, their desire, most of them? Their desire is the reestablishment of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Kingdom is... is all throughout our fabric as a world. Not only is it a part of our, our, our history and who we are as a people and humanity, it is the central theme of Scripture. Not only is it the central theme of the Bible, of Scripture, it is the central theme of the message of Jesus. Jesus spoke about the kingdom more than anything else. Now, here's what's amazing to me. All this idea about the kingdom, I mean, we're, we, we're kind of almost inbred with it. It's all through the Bible. Jesus zeroed in on it the most of any topic in his messages. And yet, most followers of Jesus Christ hardly talk about it. And I think that the reason we don't talk about it that much is because we really don't know that much about it. Oh, we'll talk about heaven. And we're going to learn, hopefully, in this series how heaven and the kingdom, where that all falls into play. We'll talk about heaven because we all know that someday we're going to die and we want to go there. But we don't talk about the kingdom. Every once in a while we'll make a reference or we'll, yeah, yeah, he's our king. But what does that mean? Do we really get it? And I don't think we really do. And that's why we don't really talk about it all that much. Thus, this series. Our goal in this series is not only talk about it, but to understand the kingdom better, to get excited about it more. And as we allow the truth of this coming kingdom to sink in, I believe it's going to shape the way that we live. And that's our goal over these next several weeks. Today, the most important thing that we have to do is kind of lay the groundwork for everywhere. I'm so glad you're here today because this is going to be so key to understanding everything else we talk about in the weeks to come. It, it's so vital that you're here, and you may even want to uh, go back and listen to this again because there's going to be some things that you'll probably want to review. Because what we have to do today in laying this groundwork, I, I, I have to show you how the kingdom message goes all through Scripture. See, because here's the problem. Without an understanding of the kingdom and the, and the fact that it's central in Scripture, then the Bible just becomes a bunch of stories that are just kind of all thrown in there. And that's not what it is. There's a purpose and a plan for everything that God put in here. I mean, this is the history of mankind from creation until even beyond, right? And that's it, right there in this book. And you go, wow, that's all that happened? No, that's not all that happened. But that's all that God said needed to be in here for us to get it. But what happens is we look at the Bible and it's like, oh, that's a nice story. Oh, another nice story. Oh, that's a convicting story. And it's just a bunch of stories thrown into a book that, that tell us about God and it helps us to know Him better. But the whole point is to understand His complete plan. So we're going to go through the whole Bible this morning. Now, why aren't you excited about that? I don't understand. 
We are. We're going to go through the whole Bible. I'm going to try to do it as quickly as I can to help you to understand the kingdom story. So if you have your notes this morning, we need to get started. We're going to look at the kingdom story. And, and man, I labored over this. Lord, how do I break this down? And, and just please hang with me. There's six points that's going to take us through Scripture to help you understand why this kingdom message is so important. And, and I'm just calling it the kingdom story. And it starts off, guess where? You guys are so smart. I am just so impressed. It starts off in Genesis, right at the beginning. Genesis chapter 1. And would you put this down? It starts off with what I'm calling the regents. The regents. You say, what's a regent? Well, you might want to put this down. A regent is one exercising ruling authority on behalf of a sovereign. You say, huh? Just hold on. We'll get to it in just a minute. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. If you've got your Bible, I'd encourage you to look at it. God has created everything. He's gone through five days. The earth is totally created. Now it's the sixth day, and He creates man and woman. And we get the general overview in chapter 1. We get the details in chapter 2. But in chapter 1, verse 26, it says this. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Get this, let them what? Rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Look, and subdue it. And what? Rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over every living creature that moves on the earth. Do you see the words? Rule, subdue, rule. You say, why did God create people? God created people to rule creation. That's why he made us. Look what it says. He made us in his image. This is kind of how it went. God said, I'm going to make people. I am the creator. I am the king. I am going to create people to be my regents. They are going to rule on my behalf my creation. They will be my representatives. Listen, my image here on earth. Let me, let me share something very interesting with you. And maybe some of you history buffs know this. But in, when the Roman Empire was in vogue, um, obviously there was no internet, there's no television, there's no radio. So, you know, how does the Caesar, how does the emperor of the Roman Empire um, get his, his rule across to all these far-reaching places? Well, he sticks these governors, these provincial governors in these places. By the way, that's who Pilate was. You remember the story of Jesus and Jesus came on trial before Pilate? He was one of these provincial governors. And they also did something very interesting. They made a bust of the Caesar. And a bust is just a, 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 a statue, so to speak, from here up. It was his head and his shoulders. They'd make a bust and they would stick it in that governor's uh, uh, main headquarters where people would come in and be judged and talk to him. So when Jesus was being judged uh, on the night he was betrayed and he went before Pilate, there was a bust of the Caesar right there. That was the image of Caesar to say to everybody who saw it, this governor stands in his place. He is a representative. This governor is a representative of this Caesar. And as you look at this image, understand who this guy is. So take that idea and plug it into here. When God made people, he said, I'm making you in my image to be my regents to rule. Does that make sense? That's why we're here. God didn't create us because we're, he was lonely. God wasn't up there going, man, I am just so bored. What am I going to, I'm going to create people because they'll be a bunch of boneheads and get in a lot of trouble and they'll pray to me and I'll have something to do. No, that's not what God did. God doesn't need us. We need him. Amen? God created man to be his regents. Now, 
the reason that the world history is full of a kingdom idea is because it's inbred in us. The idea of ruling, subduing, being kings, so to speak, is inbred in humanity. It came from God from the very beginning. But like everything else, it's been perverted and distorted. But that's how it was meant to be originally. So what happened? Here's number two. From the regents, we see the rebellion of the regents. Satan comes along in chapter 3 and he tempts Adam and Eve, the rulers, the regents, the ones who were given this authority, right? So, Adam and Eve are doing what they're supposed to do. How do we know that? Because we also read in chapter 2 that God brought all the animals to Adam and he said, Adam, whatever you name them, that's what they're going to be. Naming something was a sign of authority. Whatever you, whatever you had the opportunity to name showed that you had authority over it. We're going to talk about that in just a minute when we get back in the book of Revelation. But when God gave Adam the authority to name the animals, what he was saying is, you rule these things. They're yours. So Adam and Eve are ruling, they're enjoying life, they're enjoying each other. You talk about a perfect marriage, a perfect couple, a perfect situation. You talk about ruling your own castle, guys. There it was. It was perfect. Then Satan comes along. We know the story, but we're going to look at it again because I want you to understand it in this context. Verse 1 of chapter 3, the serpent was the shrewdest of all wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees of the garden? What's Satan doing? He's questioning the authority of the king. God, remember, he's the creator, the ruler, the king. Satan comes into the regents, to the ones who are supposed to be imaging God, and he brings into question the authority of the king. Has, has the king really said this? Of course we may eat from the fruit of the trees of the, of the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it. Look, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. What's Satan saying to her? He's saying this. Death is all about separation, right? That's, that's the basic idea of death. Death is separation. God told Adam and Eve... If you eat from this, you can have any fruit in the garden you want. Any, I mean, I've made all these different, you can have all. There's one tree, tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from it. The day that you do, you will experience death, separation. Satan comes along. There's not going to be any separation. There won't be any separation between you and the king. What's really going on is that God, the king, the creator, he's afraid that if you eat from this tree, you won't be regents anymore. You'll be kings. You won't just be in his image. You will be just like him. You will become a king. Do you see what Satan was doing? God said, I am creator, I made you, I'm giving you a special, you get to represent me. Satan comes along and says, that's not God's motive. God wants to keep you from being king. God wants to keep you from having your own kingdom. The woman was convinced she saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. In eating that forbidden fruit, Adam and Eve chose self-rule over God-rule. 
I want to be my own king. I don't want a king over me anymore. I want to be my own ruler. I, it's not enough that God's given me the ability to represent and image him and rule over creation. I want it all. I choose self-rule. And unwittingly, what they were really choosing is the rule of Satan. They, they didn't realize it, of course, because Satan is the crafty one, right? He's the father of lies. And so when they bit that fruit, they thought they were doing themselves a favor. They thought they were taking things by control. And really what they were doing is giving control to the enemy. And when they ate, death came. Remember the basic understanding of the word death is separation. When they ate, that separation came. A lot of people look at this passage and go, wow, they didn't drop dead. I guess God wasn't true. Well, physical death began there, but death in a relationship took place once they ate. They were separated. They never again would experience the same relationship that they had before they ate the fruit. Death came. Separation came. Now there's this gap between the king and those that were supposed to be regents. Now no more are you going to be regents. No more will things go the way that they're supposed to be because the relationship has been broken. You can no longer rule the way you were created to rule. In fact, that's part of the curse. The curse, God comes in and he curses the serpent and then he says guess what woman in you for you you're gonna have pain and childbirth every time you go through that pain and childbirth it should be a reminder of the separation that came because of what took place and there's also that the, the reality for the man that as he works the ground that he was supposed to rule over it's not going to yield for him like it once would why because now there's a gap and he can't be that ruler that God intended him to be because Satan came in, sold him the lie, and he bought into it. So this great position of being these representatives of God, imaging God, it was destroyed. The regents now are rebels. Here's number three. That brings us to the rest of the Old Testament. Somebody says, well, what's the Old Testament about? It's just all these weird names and stories. And then all of a sudden you got right smack dab in the middle a bunch of songs. And then you got this weird book, Song of Solomon. It's all about sex. I don't get that. And what, what is going on in this book? Here's the Old Testament in a nutshell. It's the road to restoring the kingdom. That's it in a nutshell. God says, hey, because of this, here's the consequences. Serpent, you're going to crawl on your belly. Woman, you're going to have pain in childbirth. Man, you're going to struggle getting the earth to do what it's supposed to do. But in the middle of all that, folks, was the hope of restoration. Genesis 3.15. When he, when he proclaims what's going to happen to, to the serpent. You're going to crawl on your belly. You're going to suck dust. Then he, instead of uh, zeroing in on the serpent, now he zeroes in on Satan and he says this in verse 15. I'm going to put enmity, a separation between you and the woman. Between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. And you look at that and you go, what is that all about? The seed of the woman, as you continue to read scripture, you understand that most places when it talks about the, the, um, the offspring, it talks about offspring as it relates to a man. Anytime, most every time in scripture when it refers to the offspring of the woman, the seed of the woman, it's referring to something very unique and very special. And what we see eventually in New Testament is that the Messiah, the promised anointed one, would come through the woman without the aid of a man. And so when God makes this proclamation, he's saying, look, there will be a seed that comes through the woman and this is what will happen. He is going to, literally the word there says bruised, it's crush. He's going to crush you serpent on the head. And in the process, you're going to bruise his heel. That's exactly what happened on the cross. In the process of crushing the serpent, of crushing Satan, Jesus was bruised. 
This is the very first prophecy that there will be a king who will come and he will destroy the works of this enemy who has brought separation between you and God and caused you not to be what he created you to be. Right here. And then as we go through the Old Testament, we see it over and over again. We don't have time to look at all the passages, but I got just a few. Psalm 145, verse 10. It says, All of your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. They will speak of you, the glory of your kingdom. They will give examples of your power. They will tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You rule throughout all generations. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, this is the, one of the greatest prophecies of the coming king in all of Scripture. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. Listen, government will rest on his shoulders. He, a government? Yeah, he's going to rule. And his name will be called, listen, wonderful, counselor, mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace. There'll be no end to the increase of his government on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold the justice and righteousness for then on and forevermore. Daniel 2.44, right in the middle of this prophecy that Daniel has about the nations, it says, during the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness and it will stand forever. There's so much more, folks, but I don't want to make it too bogged down for you. The Old Testament message is a road to restoring the kingdom. It was lost. The regents blew it. They rebelled. They followed the lie of the enemy. And so the Old Testament is about what God is doing to restore the kingdom that was lost. That's it, in a nutshell. So where do we go from there? Well, we step into the New Testament. And we come to number four, the redemption by the king. See, here's the thing. God cannot set up the kingdom until the separation is taken care of between the regents and the king. Sin brought separation. Sin has to be paid for. Man proved he couldn't pay for it. People proved they couldn't pay for it because they sinned. So someone who'd never sinned would have to come and redeem, bridge that gap of separation that had taken place. Well, who could do that? If people couldn't do it, it'd have to be the king himself. So Jesus comes. Matthew 1.16. We go through the whole genealogy of Jesus and you get all the way down to the end. It says, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Now we're going to get back to this during our series, but Messiah means Savior King. It's anointed one, but the idea was it was a Savior King. And so this Jesus who was going to be born, he's the Savior and the King. And then when the angel speaks to Joseph later on in chapter 1, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, don't be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will have a son, and you are to name his name Jesus. Listen, for he will save his people from their sin. Why is that a big deal? Because the gap has to be taken care of. The separation has to be redeemed. And the only one that can do this is the God-man. The king came to redeem, to heal that separation. The king came, the seed of the woman, to crush the head of the serpent. This is summarized so well here. Listen, Colossians chapter 1 verse 13, talking about what Jesus did. He has rescued us, listen, from the kingdom of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sin. Folks, 
Does that not make more sense when you read that now? The king came to redeem us back to what we were created originally to be, the representatives of himself. That's why Jesus died, to take care of that separation. So he dies. So what was the resurrection all about? The resurrection was the proof that he was really God and that everything he had really said and done was true. So he dies, he's resurrected, he's around for 40 days, and then he takes off. Why? The king's here. Why, why are you taking off? We've been waiting all these centuries for the kingdom. We've been waiting all these centuries for a savior, for a redeemer, somebody who could bridge that gap. And you've come and you've done that. What's going on? And even his disciples ask, uh, ask him uh, in Acts chapter 1 verse 6, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel? And listen, restore the kingdom? Is it now? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. They're not for you to know. But, this is important, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Wait, wait, how, why? Who cares? I just want the kingdom. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Right there we can start understanding why the king leaves. The king leaves because he wants to redeem as many people as he can. God is not willing that any should perish, scripture says, but that all should come to repentance. Why? Because he wants everybody who will to be restored to what he wanted him to be way back in the garden. So number five is this, the return of the king. And in the meantime, we are supposed to be trying to get this message of redemption. The king has come. We're going to talk about this later on. He's kind of inaugurated the kingdom and he's done that by his death on the cross and he's saying, look, I want you a part of this deal. You can't be, because of the sin in your life, separate you from me. You can't image me when we're separated. If you're separated from me, that means there's no relationship, no relationship, no ability to image, no ability to represent me. And so I want to bridge that gap so that that sin is taken care of. So now we have a relationship and now the relationship will make it possible for you to reflect me to a dying world. And so God says, look, I am going to hold back on my judgment and my coming kingdom because of my grace and mercy to mankind. It's all in 2 Corinthians 5.18. Listen. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself, brought us back, yeah, he closed the gap. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making an appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. And I hope this is making sense because this is so good. I just can't tell you. We have been redeemed Hallelujah. to rule. We, we are part of the kingdom. And we have the ability to get the message of redemption to other people by speaking the gospel and saying, He wants you too. He wants you into the kingdom too. That's the whole deal. So, Jesus tells his disciples, Look, it's not for me to tell you the time I'm coming back or at the time I'm setting up the kingdom. But what I want you to do, after you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, you go and be my witnesses. You go and tell people they can be a part of the kingdom too. So the disciples are standing there, scratching their head, trying to figure this all out. In verse 9 of chapter 1 of Acts, after saying this, 
He was taken up into the clouds while they were watching and they could no longer see him. That's another one of those big TV screens in the sky. I want to see that whole thing. These guys standing there watching it. They didn't have special effects. They didn't have movies. They didn't have, and here Jesus going up. You got to know that they're going, what on earth? is going on and it says as they strained to see him rising into heaven two white robed men suddenly stood among them men of Galilee why are you standing here staring into heaven Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go there's the promise hey men of Galilee what are you doing standing here he's already told you what you need to do you need to go to Jerusalem. You need to get the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can go and be my witnesses and tell other people that they can be a part of the kingdom too because the king is going to come back. That's what he's saying. Now, he hasn't come back yet, but we have the promise of his return and we have the picture of his return in Revelation 19:11. Then I saw heaven open and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True. For he judges fairly and he wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire. And on his head, listen, were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven dressed in the finest of pure white linen followed him on a white horse. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God the Almighty like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his thigh was written his title King of all kings and Lord of all lords. That is the return of not just a king, our king. Amen. So then what happens? And they lived happily ever after. <laughs> no, it's better than that. It's so much better than that. Watch this. If you haven't turned anywhere else in the Bible this morning, turn to Revelation 22. And if this doesn't excite you, check your pulse, because I think you're probably dead. <laughs> Verse 1. We're in the eternal state, right? Then the angel showed me, this is John, a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing, get this, where? From the throne of God in the Lamb. Here's the king ruling. It flowed down the center of the main street on each side of the river. Look! Grew what? A tree of life! Do you realize we haven't seen the tree of life since Genesis? Here it is! Where? In the eternal kingdom! Where it's supposed to be! Where it was supposed to be all along! bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything. For the throne, there it is, of God and of the Lamb will be there. And His servants will worship Him. They'll see His face and His name will be written on their foreheads. Remember, remember that idea of naming things? And uh, uh, this is a sign of ownership his name will be on their foreheads and there will be no more night there, no need for lamps or sun for the Lord God will shine on them. Listen, and they will do what? Reign forever and ever. Who? Who's this talking about? You that have trusted Christ as Savior. You get back what you lost in the garden. What was lost in the garden is restored in the kingdom. Do you see it? That is the message. That's the story of the kingdom. Folks, when you get that, you, you'll, you'll start getting. The Bible's going to make more sense to you. You're going to understand a little bit better why things are the way they are. You're not going to freak out as much when you watch the news. Look, what was lost because of sin in the garden King restores for the eternal kingdom. Man, that's what we look forward to. That's what we look forward to. 
Why are we not talking about this more? Why are we so consumed with the politics of today? When I should be looking at the politics of today and going, yep, that's exactly what happens. What do you mean that's exactly what happens? No kingdom, no kingdom that man makes will ever survive. Why? Because it's all ruled by sinners. Even with the best intentions. Wait a minute. The United States was founded on a Judeo-Christian ethic. And we were God's people. Why shouldn't we expect to rise again? We might rise again, but we're going to fall. We are doomed. It may not be in my lifetime, in your lifetime. There may be a revival. We may see some great things happen. But the United States is doomed for failure. Just like every other kingdom, empire, dynasty that there's ever been. Why? Because it's not the kingdom that God intended for us. And every time we see a, a civil war, uh, a coup, a, a, a government fall, it should be a reminder to us. These are not the kingdoms that God intended for us. My brothers and sisters who have Hawaiian ancestry, you fight for a kingdom because God placed that in your heart. But fight for the right kingdom. The right kingdom. The kingdom that has no end, that can never ever be overthrown by any government, by any, ever any man. The kingdom that's everlasting. Okay, man, I could just keep going. We got to wrap it up. Here we go, real quick. Three things. Well, how does this knowledge, so I got this now, Randy, maybe a little bit. How does this help me out? Three things. Number one, the knowledge of the kingdom affects how you use your time. Ephesians 5, 15 says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, literally how you live, not as unwise, but wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Look, folks, the older I get and the more I understand this kingdom message, the more I realize, man, I waste a ton of time on nothing. On stuff that just doesn't matter. And I need to be more focused on using my time with a kingdom mentality and a kingdom strategy. That's all I'm going to say about that for now because these are some of the things that we're going to zero in on in the weeks to come. Number two, the knowledge of the kingdom affects the way you use your treasure. Say, so, oh, what's treasure? Money. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 19, don't store up treasure here on earth where moth eats them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy. Thieves don't break in and steal. Listen, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. And then when you jump down to verse 33, he makes it very clear. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. I love the way the New Living Translation says it. It says this, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and He'll give you everything you need. Stop worrying, He says. If you are a kingdom kid, whatever you store up here is just going to get moth-eaten, rusted, corrupted. Store up stuff in the kingdom where none of that stuff can happen. Your desire should be to put the kingdom first, live right, and as you do that, God's going to take care of you. That's what he's saying. Number three, knowledge of the kingdom not only affects your time and your treasure, but where you put your trust. 1 John 2.15 Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. Why? Because that's a kingdom that's going away. That's a kingdom that's dying. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, it's not from the Father, it's from the world. The world is passing away, and all it's lust. But the one who does the will of God, listen to this, lives forever. How, how is that? Because you get to the forever kingdom. That's what he's saying. 
Where are you putting your trust? What kingdom do you put your trust in? Am I concerned about who gets into the White House in November? Yeah, of course. Because I'm concerned how it's going to affect my pocketbook, how it's going to affect our ministry. Yeah, I'm concerned about those things. But I'm not letting it eat me alive. I'm not sitting on the edge of my chair going, I hope, I hope, I hope somebody, this person gets in. I'm not, I'm not even going to battle for a candidate. I'm going to encourage you to vote for the person closest, this is really hard, closest <laughs> to what we believe. And it's going to be a lot harder to figure that out this time around. But I'm not going to fret over it. Why? Because the United States is doomed. You say, wow, Randy, that's not very patriotic. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I, I love my country. I hate to see where we've gone. But when I understand Scripture, I realize God's already told me it's going to happen. You say, well, what's going to happen with this election? I don't know. I, I'm still praying for revival. I'm still praying some amazing things take place. We turn back to God and we become the nation that God always intended us to be. But eventually we will fall because there'll be some more sinners that get into office that, that want to self-rule and they want power and they want to do their own thing. And it's doomed. You say, wow so pessimistic. No, it's not! Because I know the end of the story! There is a kingdom coming with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And because He redeemed me, I can have a part in that kingdom. And so can you. And that's what this series is about. How do we live in anticipation for this kingdom. What does that mean for you and I that follow Jesus now? He's our king now, but we're not obviously in his kingdom. What does that mean for us? How do we live? What is God telling us? Man, he's told us so much. And over the next several weeks, that's what we're going to zero in on. How to live like kingdom people before we get into the kingdom. Would you bow your heads please and close your eyes?